region civilization. Now, uh, let me start by saying that the sum total of what I've, I'm going to say is can be said in, in one sentence that we have moved from diverse, many, many diverse ways of studying history to one uniform way, to a singular mode of studying history. That is how it has evolved. And now we are going back in a way, uh, going back to diverse ways of studying his history rather than studying it in one singular way. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'll uh, jump in. I'll take up three case studies uh, in order to make my point. One could take up many more, but uh, I'll take up three case studies: that of Europe, how history has studying of history has changed in Europe and in India, ancient India, and in the Arab Muslim world. Uh, these are the case studies I'll take up. Well, let's start with Europe. Uh, we all are told that Herodotus, who lived in the 5th century BC in Greece, uh, he is a kind of father of the discipline of history. Well, in a way, uh, 5th century BC is a long way off, so obviously when he wrote something in the 5th century BC. Uh, it has it has very long vantage point, long history behind it. Uh, and therefore, it, it is considered a kind of classic opening of the discipline of history. Uh, Herodotus wrote, the book, he, the book he wrote is called Histories, not history, not single, not in the singular, but in the plural, histories. Uh, can you hear me? Hello, am I yes, audible? Sir. Yes, yes, sir, you are. Right, okay. Now, uh, he wrote histories, as I said, not history. And he mentions that he, uh, what he wrote in histories is uh, tales and traditions. He called, he calls tales and traditions uh, as histories. Uh, there is implicitly and explicitly, there is no mention of evidence for uh, evidence being produced for what he is writing. Uh, there is a kind of, there is no proof of a proof of uh, veracity, veracity of what he is writing. Uh, he is aware of the notion of truth in history, well, not truth in history, but truth about facts. So he does check some facts and uh, says these facts are right and these facts are wrong for this reason. So he's aware of the notion of uh, truth of facts, but there is no notion of historical truth, the general truth in history, that history leads us to the truth or a truth. That is absent from his histories. But the notion of the, the notion of uh, historical facts being true, that is there, as I said. Uh, now, therefore, uh, what we get from Herodotus are tales and traditions and narrations of different kinds of facts. But these are not histories, as we understand, in the sense that there is no, A, there is no, there is no proof, there is no evidence, and B, that there is no uh, general sort of statement, general lesson, general, uh, gender, general lesson that we learn from history. Uh, then come, I'm, I'm taking very long leaps because uh, in, in, in about one hour I have to compress a lot of uh, things. I, I'm taking long leaps. Then comes Christianity, uh, five centuries later. Now Christianity established a uh, a very clear distinction between truth and falsehood. This was done in the sphere of religion, that Jesus is the son of God, and therefore God has revealed his ultimate truth to humanity through his son, through Jesus, through Bible. That is the truth. That is a singular truth. Now, implicit, this is in the sphere of religion. Uh, 
it also implies that other religions which are not which are non christian forms of worship or religions they are untrue they are false and therefore uh, christianity establishes a very clear distinction between the truth and false truth the rest of them are false and the truth is embedded in in the bible so a clear distinction truth and also is established with a religion how about religion it also travels to history as we understand it uh, uh saint augustine's uh, book uh, the city of god is a very major departure it's it's a, it's not a historical work but it gives you a concept of history uh, for for the first time a very uh, general concept of history what does the city of god tell you about history one uh, it tells you that history of the world universal history is one single whole it it doesn't have it 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 may have parts but all of these parts are parts of a single whole so history unveils itself and folds itself in a pattern as a whole in the whole of the universe therefore that's one aspect of history namely history as a one single universal uh, pattern or universal whole history should has to be studied as a whole uh, and the second aspect is is that history is a is an unfolding of god's will everything that happens in the world all the incidents that uh, are narrated in history are happening because god had willed these to happen so the historical causation the causal explanation of history rests in god's will now these two are interconnected interconnected in the sense that uh we as human beings can see incidents taking place events taking place randomly you know uh, uh one is incident here one event there uh, these are all random incidents random events but god knows everything about the past the present and the future and therefore god's will when it is uh, when it is expressing itself when it is unfolding itself in the events that we witness god's in god's will these are all interconnected they are not independent events they are all interconnected events that's how they form a pattern single universal pattern so god's will as the explanation of history as the causal explanation of history uh, in a in a in, in universal history that comes to be established with saint augustine city of god and therefore history now uh, becomes a kind of branch of theology uh we also must keep in mind that the historians in europe uh, at that time uh were all all uh, church fathers uh, ecclesiastes uh that was the only the trade class in europe uh, the ruling classes the ruling dynasties were quite often quite illiterate uh is only the in the second or third uh, generation of the dynasty that they that they become literate or reasonably literate but the literate is only the ecclesiast class of ecclesiast and therefore they are also the historian now as 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 ecclesiast they are trained to think in terms of god's will manifesting itself all the time and therefore the histories that they write are histories uh in terms of god's will manifesting itself in human e- events uh <coughs> and history thus <coughs> excuse me history thus becomes a branch of theology very 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 basically a branch of theology uh we'll talk about this history as a branch of theology slightly later again but let me emphasize here that history in medieval europe becomes a branch of theology firm and irrevocably uh and, and therefore 
the concept of once again there is no concept of evidence there is no concept of proof uh, for uh, for the for checking the veracity of an event uh, or, or 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 veracity of a historical narrative uh, the fact that the narrator is a respectable person is enough of veracity you have to accept it because it's being you are being told of uh, you are you, you are being told of these events by a respectable theologian and therefore uh, uh, that is what history is no 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 notion of uh, checking the facts no, no notion of uh, veracity no, no notion of evidence etc etc now uh, since it is a branch of theology and since divine will is the only explanation for historical events you can therefore understand that it is a single explanation there is no diversity of explanation only one explanation namely god has will it so every war that takes place every atonement that takes place every deposition that takes place whatever it's it takes place because god had will it so so there is only one explanation given to us uh, by by medieval uh, theologian historians uh from what the seven i'm again taking big leap uh, of time from what the 17th century onwards uh, things began to change a little earlier a little later but 17th century is a kind of you know uh, important uh, point of time when things begin to change uh, what happened in the 17th century is that uh records of events or records of transactions began to be kept uh, began to be kept at the state level began to be kept at the private level in the families and uh, families of big nobles and so on and so forth so the notion of the notion of record kept gave a stimulus to the notion of verifying your fact when which you have you have verified these facts if, if in relation to the uh, in relation to the records uh, which are being kept and therefore a bit of notion of evidence for uh, proving your proving the authenticity of narration uh, of your narrative that began to arise uh, in the 17th century in the 17th 18th century also the notion of uh primary and secondary evidence began to grow uh primary evidence as you know as to of history you know primary evidence is that which is uh, which is contemporaneous with the events or near contemporaneous with the events that you are describing uh uh so and so rule uh, so and so for this battle uh, at this time in this field etc against so and so uh somebody who is who was participant in that battle or witness to that battle is describing that that becomes a private prime david but somebody writing about 200 year, years of 300 years later about that battle he is also right he or she is also writing very uh, very uh, based on evidence but that becomes secondary uh, it's not primary and secondary it doesn't mean more important and less important but it is that that's how uh, historians divide their the evidence primary evidence or the secondary evidence in terms of how close the evidence is to the narrative uh, of the historian so that the notion of primary and secondary evidence also began to evolve around the 17th century so on uh, also that in the post renaissance europe uh, the notion of reason uh, reason began to uh, gain primacy not not your intuitive kind of uh, knowledge or knowledge based on your uh, knowledge based on your uh, memory or assumption or what has been passed down to you but uh, or what you think is right the but uh, you have to explain history in terms of reason so reason uh, which was the sort of Uh, uh, leading uh, 
marker of uh, renaissance and post renaissance europe the reason began to be associated with historical explanation by 19th century uh, history has evolved as a discipline actually history as a discipline doesn't have a long his long uh, lineage behind it it's a very recent phenomenon 19th century is a phenomenon when history began to evolve as a discipline a uh, fully fledged discipline where uh, which 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 one uh, place in uh, educational institutions like universities and research institutions and so on and and fully and historians became fully fledged professional historians so it's a 19th century phenomenon in europe we'll see uh, how does it happen how does it uh, evolve elsewhere but uh, in europe it's a 19th century phenomenon now uh, what happened in the 19th century uh, was one that a emphasis on empiricism began to gain primacy uh, you have to you have to check your facts <clears throat> you have to check your facts the authentic authenticity of facts uh, empirical facts uh, before you put out a narrative it's also uh, empiricism has another term which is slightly different from empiricism namely positivism but positivism is, is slightly different from empiricism but empiricism is really the uh, the primacy of the authenticity of facts so historian's task is to collect facts uh, authentic facts now uh, Leopold von Ranke, uh, the German historian, the the the, the main, the chief uh, driving force of this empiricism in Europe, uh, defines history uh, very very briefly, very short uh, short definition. He tells us as it really happened. He says, "What is history? What does history do?" history tells us as it really happened now there are two emphases here in this one is that uh, it's not the historian but it's the it's history which tells us what really happened how does history tell us what really happened uh historian knowledge may be defective de deficient uh, his or her understanding of facts may not be very right etc etc but history will tell us as it really happened how will history tell us when all the facts of history will have been collected at one time when all the facts of history will have been collected then history will tell us tell us as it really happened so the emphasis is on history rather than on historians and the second emphasis is is on as it really happened as it really happened. that that is to say uh, history tells us leads us to an objective truth which there can be there can't be any doubt about that truth it is real it is tells us as it really happened uh, so that uh, the notion of objective truth which that the the, the certitude Uh, em embedded in this notion that it really this is how exactly how it really happened the certitude embedded this the with this notion of objective truth of history that was established in the 19th century by ranke and it became pervasive uh, throughout the world but i'll come to that in a little later uh, so the notion of objective truth is given to us how does the how does one object how does one arrive at objective truth what one arrives at objective truth uh, through collection of objective facts the facts that have been collected in the records uh, preserved in the archive these are all objective facts once they have been recorded they become objective facts. and therefore the historian's task is to go on collecting these facts and once all the facts have been collected history will tell us in very unambiguous terms how what really happened in the past so history tells us 
as it really happened. Uh, really is the emphasis on the, the, the emphatic point. Uh, so the notion of an objective truth and objective facts was established by uh, Ranke very firm, and it became very, uh, very uh, well accepted by historians. Uh, the this this uh, uh, kind of uh, this kind of notion of objective objective uh, history and objective facts of history this notion spread to the rest of the world it spread to the rest of the world not merely because of its uh, intellectual uh, uh, intellectual power but also but much more than intellectual power was because of its uh, political and uh, economic and uh, military power uh, that accompanied the spread of Europe to the rest of the world, the expansion of Europe to the rest of the world. Therefore, uh, as Europe expanded uh, to the rest of the world through colonialism, uh, it not only brought arms and trade and, and political power to the rest of the world through col colonies, but it also brought to the world its intellectual concepts, like the notion of objective truth in history. So the rest of the world accepted the notion of objective truth in the 19th and a good part of the 20th century. Uh, the, 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 the notion of the objective truth is also inherent, for example, in, uh, in uh, Marxism. Marxism also it differs from uh, um, empiricism and positivism considerably, but it also accepts the notion of uh, objective truth embedded in history and objective facts. So that the notion spread to the rest of the world. What did it do? It, uh, it eradicated uh, or virtually eliminated all other notions of history that were prevalent in the rest of the world, some of which I'll be talking about. A while, uh, just in a few minutes. Uh, the other uh, modes of uh, looking at history and what does uh, what does uh, history involve? Study of history involves it involves uh, the notion of time and the notion of space primarily. Uh, uh, I am a, uh, as you mentioned, I am a student of primarily of medieval India. Medieval is time, India is space. Somebody may be a student of modern China. Modern is time, China is space, and so on and so forth. Ancient world, and so on. <clears throat> so time and space are the constituents of uh, constituent of the study of history, in essential ingredients of the study of history. Uh, Different civilizations have different notions of time and space, uh, very, very different notions of time and space. And now all of these different notions of time and space were subdued by one notion of time and one notion of space, namely the one that is given to us by, uh, by empiricism. Uh, and the notion of time is given to us by, uh, by what was what is called what was called BC and AD, uh, which is called E and A and C. But you know the the the, the nomenclature change, but it essentially it remains the same. BC and AD, uh, the basis of BCE and CE. But anyway, so the 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 all these other notions of history. Uh, prevalent in different parts of the world, I'll speak of two of them just now. Uh, they were subdued under this uh, under this uh, notion of objective history or empiricist history, <clears throat> uh, or if you like, positive history. This uh, sub subjugation of other notions of history from the rest of the world has been captured in a beautiful book called The Theft of History by uh, Jack Goody. Uh, Jack Goody was actually a historian of the family at one time in Cambridge. Now he's diversified to different uh, different themes. His his book about I think seven eight ten years ago, the theft of history, is a wonderful book. How 
all the other notions of history from the rest of the, of history and time and space from the rest of the world were subjugated to this one notion that we inherited from Europe. Uh, so that's how history changed uh, in Europe from Herodotus to 19th century, uh, Ranke and, and, and many others. How, that's how history changed. The study of history changed. Uh, and it changed, and uh, that's how it spread to the rest of the world. That's about Europe. Uh, let me take up another uh, mode of study of history, namely the Arab Muslim, Arab Islamic vision of history. Uh, one that, uh, in some ways, like Christianity, uh, uh, this the study of history in Arab Islamic world is also connected with religion, with Islam. Uh, Islam gave a new religion to the world, but it also gave a new concept of history to the world, to the Arab world particularly, Arab Muslim world particularly. Uh, not that no. the, uh, Hello? Yes? Yes, sir, you can continue. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Shall I stop or carry on? No, no, it is, it's, it's okay. You can carry no. on, sir. That, that, so I yes. said it. it yeah, okay. Uh, <clears throat> In a while, some other name pop up. Anyway, I'll carry on. The Arab, Arab Islamic world got a new religion and a new concept of history. Uh, they didn't have a concept of history earlier. Uh, Islam gave them a concept of history. Uh, so it's connected to, to Islam. Uh, Islam gave them a concept of history to begin with. Uh, the biographies of Muhammad and his caliph, was biographies, etc., were written of Muhammad and caliphs and so on. But gradually, it spread out to dynasties, regions in their dynasties. So it began to spread out to dynastic histories. Uh, and dynastic histories were broken down to regional histories, histories of each, each reign uh, in, within a dynasty and so on and so forth. So that was one. The second was that it spread out to the history of civilizations. Uh, Ibn Khaldun, the historian, Arab historian, is a most outstanding example of study of uh, uh, civilizations as part of history. But he's, he's exceptional, but he's not the only one, others also. It also gave a concept of world, history of the world, though. The world that they spoke of was uh, the world uh, which was uh, mainly the world that Islam had established itself. But the concept was that of the world. So it gave, one, it was, it gave a new concept of history. B, it gave a, a, a concept of world history. Uh, and C, it gave a concept of dynastic history. Dynastic history. Uh, the most important contribution of uh, Arab Islamic history is the very strict awareness to chronology. Every event is very strictly placed within the chronological framework. The chronology that they use is the era that they use is Hijra era, era, mostly the exceptions, but mostly they use the Hijra era. But each event is very firmly placed uh, in a, its it's, it's uh, the occurrence of day and month and year and so on and so forth is very strictly there to and, and, and narrated. So that the very fact and, and, and also that the notion of a, an archive which uh, had begun to develop in the 17th century, the notion of an archive had developed 
in some parts of the world or world where is uh, muslims are ruling uh, for example uh, abul fazal's ayne akbari it's impossible to think of uh, writing a, a book like ayne akbari without an archive archival uh, sources so that the notion of archive the notion of technology I and mean, then the notion of what is called isnad in arabic isnad is uh, is not is, is, you know when i narrate an event to you you accept you can get the message then you check where did i get the information about that event then you check that second source of information or second uh, source for that information uh, and it's sort of, then you check who did that second source got its information from what is or her information from so that you go back to the original source of any piece of information therefore i mean it's true that even original uh, source of information can be uh, can be misleading uh, it's also possible but you know the what i have what i'm suggesting is that the notion of authenticity and authenticating and uh, a narrative authenticating an event authenticating uh, the self the 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 authenticating the veracity of the event most emphasized by when you say this event took place on this day this year in this place at that time you are also in a way lending authenticity to the to that event so the notion of uh, authentic authentic authentifying part of the event to take the veracity of the authentic veracity of the event that was in the uh, such tradition of, uh, of recording events in the chronological order uh, and before very 
Indian flag taking the most of the part. I think I do so. Primarily annotated the secret have any and it not only no concept of history, but the notion of the past in the case. It is the sort of uh, never changing world existence. I think nothing ever changed in this in in the in the sense. Uh, as the sense of service was uh there is more society that uh uh every type of I don't have a concept of the past, but as a sense of it. India also has a sense of the past. You see, uh, several historians have explored this uh, uh, VS Mons, who had done this in the 1960s, and the last couple had recently done a magnificent book on how the sense of the past manifested itself, expressed itself in ancient India. Literature, ancient India, various kinds of texts. Uh, there are religious texts and non-religious texts, there are Hindu texts, Hindu religious texts, Buddhist religious texts, Jain religious texts, there are Smriti and uh, where the notion of the past is embedded. Chronology is constructed partly uh, through points and partly through, uh, in fact, largely through uh, epigraphs and so on, also through texts. So, uh, a, a notion of the past exists, uh, uh, and that uh, chronology, well, various chronology, not one. In, in the Christian world, there was one chronology, BC and AD. In the Arab Islamic world, there was different. There was one chronology of history, mainly one chronology of history. Era. In the ancient Indian uh, context, there were many chronologies. Uh, so that so all of these history, those words, you know, the words that I in the this the truth. By the later 20th century, second half of the 20th century, this quarter of the quarter of the of the years of the 20th century, this notion of objective fact of the truth in history, this came under question. Does history actually tell us as it really happened? Can history tell us as it really happened? No, it can't. Why can't it? Because A, because much of the past has been destroyed, it gets destroyed almost every day. Much of the past has been destroyed, uh, and it can never tell you, give you the full picture anyway. And secondly, that more, much more important, uh, the notion of objective fact recorded in the archives is a very, very dubious notion, very questionable. The, uh, in the archives, human beings have today role to play in these facts. Uh, human beings created those facts, human beings recorded those facts, and human beings are receiving those from the archive. At every level, human beings, their, uh, their concepts, their perceptions, their prejudices, which are recorded and which are received. And therefore, they are not really uh, really uh, objective. Uh, they are really uh, given different subjective meanings. There are many meanings. In fact, as a as a as many meanings, uh, many meanings in it. There is no activity of that. Objectivity of the truth. One can uh, take any example. One example is the first one. We talk of ancient medieval and modern order. The notion of ancient medieval and modern, is it an objective fact? Is it really uh, true that uh, uh, history has always been divided into ancient medieval and modern? Uh, no, it wasn't. 
Most of Asian people of Jordan also came to us. Uh, also came to us from Europe. It's the same. But 1688, when one German historian Silarius gave a notion of Asian women. What the? What are the implications of this notion? The the meaning of Middle East. Europe defined as modern, and modern. The term modern was used earlier also, the fifth century. But you know, the, in the fifth century, the term modern was used for the present, as distinct from the past. There was no value judgment in the term modern in the fifth century. In the seventeenth century, when the term modern was used, it it is it gets embedded with the value judgment. What is the value judgment? Modern means rational. Modern means scientific. Modern means primacy uh, of reason in life or explanation or understanding. So modern is rational, and since modern is rational, the medieval was defined as irrational, as its counterpart, as its other, as ir, the dark age, as it was. To modern age is age of enlightenment. The medieval age is the age of dark age. It's a dark age of irrationality and religion. So, ancient, medieval, and modern. These terms are not objective reality. These are value judgment. Uh, any, any, any. Uh, Look at nation, the term nation, uh, or nationalism. Nationalism does it have one meaning? Uh, nationalism was the cause of uh, two world wars. Uh, uh, when nations were fighting for territorial rights, uh, uh, nationalism. Is also the cause for uh, national liberation movements against colonial. So nationalism led to colonialism, uh, uh, Europe, Europe's colonization of the rest of the world, and nationalism led to anti-colonial wars, anti-colonial struggles on the other. So nationalism has many. Nationalism uh, can, can integrate the nation, can also integrate. The Part of the, the use of land nationalism today around the world, but in India, including the country. So that nationalism itself is a objective reality. Nationalism is embedded. The term itself is embedded with uh, with uh, uh, with. Uh, Big value for uh, uh, any 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 concept, any term, any fact that you pick up is value loaded in the sense that it has been created by human beings, it has been recorded by human beings, and it is being retrieved by human beings. And at each each level, certain assumptions of human beings and certain. Uh, uh, Certain uh, places you like of human beings get embedded, and there is like an objective fact, and nothing like an objective reality. Uh, and therefore, this questioning of the random notion of the truth, the single truth in history, that uh, question has again opened up diverse, has uh, generated diverse perceptions and interpretations of history. In place of objective fact or objective reality, the context becomes important. In what context is that uh, narration being uh, being being uh, studied? So that the context uh, of any fact or any narration or any concept or any theory uh, becomes important. What is the, I, I gave you the example of nation, nation and nationalism. Different contexts have lent to different meanings. So different meanings arise from different con contexts. 
in which these are studied. So in a way, uh, the questioning of this notion, Rankian notion of objective truth, single objective truth, has led again, uh, has brought us back to pluralist visions of the past, not a single vision, uh, but a pluralist, but plurally many vision of the past. Uh, however, the pluralist visions don't imply that your, your, your vision is yours and my vision is mine and my history is mine and your history and all of it are equally right or equally true. Uh, it is true that the truth are uh, different ways, not as if are at par. Because the uh, question of two, quest two, uh, two uh, premises of the discipline of history remain in entire, namely one is a question of evidence. Uh, one is a question of evidence. Uh, you have to produce evidence for whatever you, uh, whatever you, you write or say uh, or narrate. Uh, evidence is primary. This is uh, Rankian's uh, contribution. Evidence is as is important. And the second is that you give a rational explanation rather than fanciful explanations like, you know, I mean, if I, if I, uh, uh, Mahabharata had internet, uh, that's how uh, Rastra was uh, getting informed through internet about uh, things happening in the field, or uh, things like uh, ancient India had stem cell uh, science and so on and so forth, or nuclear weapons and so on and so forth, you know, or any other, uh, and this is this is true of India, but this is also true of many other parts of the world, the fancy full kind of uh, claims for its ancient ancient civilization. So, 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 uh, we are, we are, we, these fanciful, fanciful uh, claims are, are not history. Uh, and therefore, history does not a, it goes by evidence, and B, it goes by a rational explanation of history. Rational explanation is not one rational explanation. There can be many rational explanations. There are many rational explanations all the time. But nonetheless, you have to have evidence and reason, and the context of that evidence and context of that reason, uh, that these are the most, these are the analytical tools available to the historian, along with I think combined with a respect for the diversity of views, you have to respect uh, others' views also. If they are based on evidence and rational explanation, these are also uh, to be respected as equally, uh, uh, equally, uh, equally honorable historical explanations. But the notion of one single explanation of any kind, whether it is religious or it is even even marxism uh, gave us the notion of one single truth or one single explanation all history is the history of class struggle so class struggle is the single explanation of all history even marxism in a way inherited the notion of a single explanation from theology uh, and gave us that so any one single explanation uh, is is no uh, viable you have to have to rally to in rally to then which has been proposed by many many centuries well thank you sir uh, that is what uh, i had to say uh,